Hello friends. Today we are going to continue with the second part of John Kitts and in our last video we have discussed about few of the details of his work. Today we are going to continue with few more. The topics that we have chosen are important so please be careful and attentive during the video. Let's start. Let's discuss his another ode which is Ode to a Nightingale which was published in the year 1819. Let's talk about the poetry. Ode to a Nightingale was written by the romantic poet John Keats in the spring of 1819. At 80 lines it is the longest of Keats odes. The poem focuses on a speaker standing in a dark forest listening to the beguiling and beautiful song of the nightingale bird. This provokes a deep and meandering meditation by the speaker on time, death, beauty, nature and human suffering, something the speaker would very much like to escape. Friends, here John Keats talks about the modern life escapement. Nobody likes to remain in boredom and stereotypical lifestyle. Therefore, it's nature which takes us away from this dready life and gives us pleasure. And this is what John Keats wanted from the nature. This poetry is a phenomenal poem that relates life's sufferings to the briefness of the bird's song. It was first published in 1819. It was written by John Keats, a popular romantic poet we have already discussed. The poem explores the wonder of life and death. It comprises the experience of poet, his miseries and poetic imagination. Its popularity lies in the fact that it represents things related to life, art, literature and nature and seeks a common relationship among them. Let's see the detailed summary of the poetry. The speaker opens with a declaration of his own health. He feels numb, as though he had taken a drug only a moment ago. He is addressing a nightingale he hears singing somewhere in the forest and says that his drowsy numbness is not from envy of nightingale's happiness but rather from sharing it too completely. He is too happy that nightingale sings the music of summer from amid some unseen plots of green trees and shadows. In the second stanza, the speaker longs for the oblivion of alcohol, expressing his wish for wine, a draught of vintage, that would taste like the country and like peasant dances, and let them and let him leave the world unseen and disappear into the dim forest with the nightingale. In the third stanza, he explains his desire to fade away, saying he would like to forget the troubles the nightingale has never known, the weariness, the fever and the fright of human life, with its consciousness that everything is mortal and nothing lasts. Youth grows pale and spectre thin and dies. And beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes. In the fourth stanza, the speaker tells the nightingale to fly away. And he will follow, not through alcohol, not charioted by Bachus and his pods, but through poetry, which will give him viewless wings. These lines explains the desire of the poet and he finds extreme power in poetry 
which gives him invisible or imaginative wings. He says he is already with the nightingale and describes the forest glade. When even the moonlight is hidden by the trees, except the light that breaks through when the breezes blow the branches. In the fifth stanza, the speaker says that he cannot see the flowers in the glade, but can guess them in embalmed darkness, white hawthorn, eglantine, violets, and the musk rose, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eaves. In the sixth stanza, the speaker listens in the dark to the nightingale, saying that he has often been half in love with the idea of dying and called death soft names in many rhymes. Surrounded by the nightingale's song, the speaker thinks that the idea of death seems richer than ever and he longs to seize upon the midnight with no pain while the nightingale pours its soul ecstatically forth. If he were to die, the nightingale would continue to sing, he says, but he would have ears in vain and be no longer able to hear. In the seventh stanza, the speaker tells the nightingale that it is immortal, that it was not born for death. He says that voice he hears singing has always been heard by ancient emperors and clones, by homesick Ruth. He even says the song has often charmed open magic windows looking out over the foam of perilous seas in it lands forlorn. In the eighth stanza, the word forlorn tolls like a bell to restore the speaker from the preoccupation with the nightingale and back into herself. As the nightingale flies farther away from him, he laments that his imagination has failed him and says that he can no longer recall whether the nightingale's music was a vision or a waking dream. Now that the music is gone, the speaker cannot recall whether he himself is awake or asleep. Important points from the poetry. The poem explores two main issues. The first is the connection between agony and joy and the second is the connection between life and death. The poet very artistically draws a comparison between natural and imaginative world, the world of a nightingale. Death, immortality, Mortality and poetic imaginations are some of the major themes of this ode. Keats says that death is an unavoidable phenomenon. He paints it in both negative and positive ways. The poet also present the life, presents the life and melodious song of Nightingale in juxtaposition. To him, life is mortal, but the song of Nightingale is immortal. Ode to a Nightingale is written in eight stanzas in this poem, with ten lines in each stanza. The first seven and last two lines of each stanza are written in iambic pentameter. The eighth line of each stanza is written in trimeter with only three accented syllables instead of five. The poem follows A B A B C T E C T E throughout the poem with iambic pentameter. End rhyme is used to make the stanza melodious, such as in the first stanza. The rhyming words are Paints, drains, drink, drunk, sunk.
let's move towards another important poetry that is Ode to Psyche. Here, Ode to Psyche is a poem by John Keats, written in spring of 1819. The poem is the first of his 1819 odes, which include Ode on a Grecian Urn and Ode to a Nightingale. Let's move towards summary of the poetry. The speaker addresses the ode to the goddess Psyche, asking her to hear, asking her to hear these tuneless numbers, and pardon him for singing her own secret into her ear. He is unsure whether he has dreamt of the winged Psyche or had seen her with his own eyes. He describes wandering in a forest thoughtlessly and nearly fainting with surprise at seeing two fair creatures embracing next to a stream. The speaker immediately recognized the winged boy as the god Eros and then wonders if the person he is embracing is the goddess Psyche. He recalls that Psyche was the latest born and loveliest vision of all the gods and goddesses on Mount Olympus. Friends, you have to keep these words in mind, Mount Olympus and Lord Eros, etc. Okay. He laments that she has no temple devoted to her because she arrived too late for antique vows or the old ways of worshipping goddesses. However, the speaker declares he will be her choir and priest and build a temple to her within his mind where no one else can access it. The sanctuary he builds will be surrounded by dark clustered trees streams and stars without a name with an open windows to let warm love in so these were the important points from this poetry we will include other details in our next video till then we meet take care bye bye and all the best for your examination